So, um, today we're going to be talking about ancient women and modern women and all women because I love women. Um, <coughs> in democracy. Hey, uh, just, just like three things. First of all, a content warning for sexism, racism, homophobia, and there's also a part that talks about sexual assault, but I have a timestamp there, so you can skip that bit if you want to. Also, by the way, I'm talking about women in like a very AFAB gender binary way, just because I don't think the, the people who created our democratic societies were smart enough to think about gender as this whole constructed thing that didn't really matter. But since it is a thing, and since we've had bodies are still very much sexualized, especially, just know that I, I, I am aware of a, a larger binary and uh, the, the social constructs of gender and all of that, that fun, fun bit. Anyways, yeah, enjoy. A little known fact about this channel is I've been taking Latin for five years. Before that, I participated in a Latin camp for another five years, and then I was a counselor at that very same camp. What that means is I know a lot about the classics. Now, if you're a classics person, this video is not going to be about the discourse surrounding that, and even if classics should be a field of study with the way it is now or what we need to do to fix that. Rather, I have found the way we teach classics as an interesting study to see how America's founding fathers modeled their society and built their ideology that still permeates until this day. Big girl words. Neoclassicism, if you will. And in that, how did they, in the past in America now, define women in this model of democratic society? Now we'll be calling America and Greece and all these other places a democracy, even though I do not believe any of these societies function as what I personally would consider democracy. But this video is about the role of women in these democracies, and so this is going to be very Western-centric. But we're also going to be talking about how women in general are depicted in the media of these societies. I know what you're thinking if you're in on this discourse, you're, you know the gender binary has changed over time, but I think it is more accurate to believe that women of the past were more so thought of as lesser men than the broad distinction we have today. And again, I don't think that's going to make very much a difference. What you do need to know is that titties are very important to this conversation. They're important to every conversation, to be fair. They are... Um, without further ado, let's talk about women and their roles in a democratic society. Here we are defining democracy as its original Greek definition, demoskratia, by the people, of the people, for the people. However, democracy takes many different shapes and forms, so whatever society calls itself a democracy and runs itself according to a principle of allowing a pool of people to rule the government is a democracy. The pool in democratic Athens was male citizens. It used to be only land-owning male citizens, but that changed after the Persian War. Citizens made up of around 10% of the population, the rest being made up of women, medics, who are foreigners who worked in the city, and enslaved peoples. However, there is a distinction between women as there is a distinction between men. There are Athenian women. These are women born to male citizens and their wives. Who were rich women. At some point, male citizens did have to marry women born to a male citizen. Athenian women had more rights than medic women, and obviously more rights than enslaved women, and there were all of these different women, all of which who did not have political freedom. When we talk about democracy in Athens, the end and beginning of it usually is that women were left out of it, 
and that is what I remember learning. We had a unit in my history class in like middle school, and it was just like, yeah, there were Athenian women. They could not leave the house. End of women. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. And yeah, they were supposed to avoid being mentioned in the public fora. Despite these expectations, most women still had to work, including inside the household. Sometimes these jobs would be working at the family business or on a farm. Other times they would be participating in sex work, which was fairly common for medic women to do. Women, mostly medic women, could own small businesses that were under male magistrates, but they could not represent themselves in court or do large transaction without approval. They could also be held accountable for adultery and other indecent behaviors after Pericles' laws introduced. So even though they couldn't represent themselves, they still could be held accountable for laws that they broke, even though they didn't have a say in those laws. So through law, their individual rights and liberties were decided on men, but they could still live and work. I think it's weird that we say the end all be all is that women could stay inside, when the reality of it is that there's so many women that had to work, and there were also enslaved women who were forced to work. Similarly, early, similarly, some sim, sims. Early American democracy allowed women rights and property. Many of the founding fathers' wives had their own wealth and their own ventures. Martha Washington inherited a great wealth from her father and also had a huge mitosis cracked and also had a huge influence in the revolution, staying in camp with her husband and working with the Daughters of Liberty. Women were not silent figures when they were not given direct political power. They still had and have their place in democracy. Their subordination may have been ideal for male leaders, but their lives were vastly different from the rhetoric that surrounds them. And while they may have been written about as courtesans, concubines, and slaves, it's more likely that the reality of these women is far different from what we're talking about today and the deviant life that they were assumed to have. So, when looking at rhetoric surrounding the ownership of women and their bodies, it may not reflect the actual day-to-day -day lives of most women in these societies, but rather the cultural mindset surrounding women and their role or lack thereof in politics. AK, we are not talking about the people, we are talking about their bodies and what being a woman means to these societies and the, the rhetoric they, they use about our bodies to subjugate women. Or even though women were barred from the active place in the political sphere of Athens, it's still important to look at their exclusion because analyses of democracy, both modern and ancient, are incomplete without examining women's rights. Outside of politics, women still held an important impact on culture, specifically of Athens. From the Athena Parsonos to the Statue of Liberty, images of women depicting important values of democratic society were and still are everywhere, but the female body has also been used as a representation of a sexual deviance and evil to women to argue against tyrants and women in power like in the Orestia and the myths of the Amazons. All of these depictions of women come together to objectify them. This art is supposed to dehumanize them and turn them into whatever men want rather than fully realized beings that could be able to vote. The female idea is presented in three primary ways. One, displaying what a good woman should be to a democratic society. Two, showing the horror of a woman with power. And three, vilifying and over-sexualizing medic and enslaved women. So, part one, the good Athenian woman. You know what a trad wife is? You know what a trad wife is. So, let's talk about ancient Greek trad wives, traditional wives, your, your wife who, who, you know, makes you a sandwich. I don't know what wives do. This role of a wife is obviously important to the structure of these societies. In fact, a lot of Western societies, even though they cannot vote. So how do they get their beliefs about women? Hesiod, one of the key writers of the myth history of Greece, wrote about Pandora, saying, even so, Zeus, who thunders on high, made women to be an evil to mortal men with a nature to do evil. For those uninitiated, Pandora was the mythological first woman who opened a jar that released all the evil into the world. Therefore, the first woman created all evil. Now, 
let's get a little biblical with this, shall we? Let's get a little Bible study up in here. A little Bible. Little little Bible. Um what did the first woman do? What was her name? Eve. She ate the apple and released all the bad stuff into the world. And I've never read the Bible and I'm not Christian, but I still know this. It seems like a predominant religious text of Greece matches a predominant religious text of America because a lot of people in America are Christian and a lot of them get to read about how women brought evil into this world. Hesiod continues to lament about marriage, saying, whoever avoids marriage and the sorrows of women cause and will not be wed reaches deadly old age without anyone to tend his years. So yeah, women are bad, but you need, we need them to take care of us. Marriage was understood in ancient Athens as a taming of pubescent girls before they became wild sexual beings. Hesiod already gives us a distinction. All women, except virgins, are evil, and marriage tames them and gives men someone to take care of them. If left unregulated, then they will bring chaos. I mean, fair, but chaos is fun! Also, by the way, side note, virgin here means unmarried girls. Anyways, this idea that women were evil and they had to be tamed is what made their bodies so fascinating. A note here, the female Athenian citizens were often not depicted nude, although it would happen occasionally, but the typical depiction of men was nude. An early example of this is the Koros, which is a nude male grave markers, compared to the Kori counterparts, which are clothed female figures. These examples predate Athenian democracy, but established a tradition that carried through the time period. The Statue of Athena and the Parthenon, as well as the Caryatids that held up the walls of the Erechtheion, are emblematic of this tradition. Most images of goddesses and mythological figures on pottery were also clothed, sarcophagi and grave steely on an dead Athenian women often had them seated and clothed, appearing rich and proper. There was a lot of emphasis on their drapery and their beauty in that way. Nothing is more emblematic of this than the Athena Parthenos, which is a statue that is missing but we've been able to see through recreations. In fact, there's a big old recreation of the Parthenon and Parthenos in Tennessee. She's a regal woman who used to stand 38 feet tall. And you can see that she wears a large helmet and a breastplate, yet despite these elements of war, she is still in a traditional chitin. She is still feminine and regal. The Statue of Liberty is similar to the Athena Parthenos. It holds a commanding position with her torch in hand and looms over its visitors while wearing a modest chitin too. Both of these statues are depictions of their respective societies as a whole. Athena was a patron of Athens, and liberty is the concept that Americans are supposed to strive and fight for. America is called the land of liberty for a reason. Maybe not an accurate one, but for a reason. And both of these important figures are women who watch over the city. However, these depictions do not suggest that women are matriarchs, but rather they are patrons that help men prosper as women should. This is even more clear in the caryatids that hold up the erechtheion. These women hold up the walls without struggle. Their faces are neutral and they are not cowering under the immense weight of the tower. Their hair is similar to that of Athena Parthenos, whose strands fall onto their shoulders from behind their neck. They wear a similar garment, but the drapery clings to them and highlights their breasts. I hate that I use the word breasts. Let's highlight their boobies, their boobs. These women are holding a building for a man, Erechtheus. They are holding up his glory and supporting him. These pieces shows that women's role is to support men, but there is another reason why these concepts are depicted as women. Their primary audience was men. When people think of statues for societies or public artwork, and those societies, the top echelon is men. 
then the art created for those societies is going to reflect their value. Athenian women ensured security for their husband's legacy by birthing children, yet they were still kept inside, in different quarters by the way, that very few were allowed to enter, either richer women. And their bodies were still commodified, even though they were the top women. When you see depictions of women, clothed women, valued women, and these societies, the drapery still finds a way to cling to their bodies so that they still are modest, but they also are sexy. These women were made to support men, and good women were supposed to stay away from their gaze. But of course, there are still public symbols to show the support that a good woman should have. So now let's talk about the neoclassical ideal of liberty. Neoclassicism is essentially the bane of my existence. It's also a revival of ancient Greek aesthetics and philosophy in order to define a perfectly enlightened and fair society. It came around at the same time as the Enlightenment, which you may know is the period of Western society where we started to get really involved in science and philosophy again, and then decided to give medicine a good old college try once more. It's basically a bunch of white dudes rediscovering Plato. White dudes do not need to rediscover Plato. Get rid of Plato. Get better. Neoclassicism appealed to a manner of European countries, but particularly it helped France and the United States shape their societies. So, Let's talk about some of this art. Hi, just a distinction I wanted to make for you all lovely, lovely people. Our society, our democracy, didn't actually base all of our stuff off of Greece because they thought that it gave people too much power. And I just thought you needed to know that. Anyways. So let's talk about some art. In Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People, a woman dressed in classical garments stands above a crowd of trampled people during the French Revolution, carrying a torch and a French flag. Behind her are citizens of different classes, a rich merchant in top hat, and poorer workers in less refined clothes following her lead. She leads the French through the revolution to victory. She leads them from the monarchy to the freedom and liberty. However, once the French Republic was founded, French women were not allowed to vote in this republic or the republics that followed because, you know, World War's janky until 1944. The dome of the rotunda in the US Capitol depicts the colonies as women, which recalls the tradition of different provinces in Rome and Greece being referred to in the feminine form. These provinces were lands man had conquered. The depiction does not say that women have any place in democracy, but almost reinforces their ownership. The representation of these colonies were also painted in a space during the time where the primary audience would be men. Thus, these women were painted for their gaze. Depictions of women at the forefront of democracy are often used to show some sort of ownership of them, or purity of ideas, rather than a promotion of women's liberation. This feminine representation of democracy can be traced back to Athens, specifically Athens' namesake, Athena. Part 2, Girl Boss Girls. Ah, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. So I know this is about the body, kind of, but we gotta talk about her girl bossness because there are so many versions of myths that talk about Athena, and a lot of people love the interpretations that are very feminist, where Athena is helping women, but that she's still turned Arachne into a spider. And you can see that as a pity, or you can see that as Athena getting mad that there was a woman that was better than her at a skill that she was good at. And you can see her turning Medusa into a being that men could not look at as a way of saving her from the tragedy that happened in Medusa's life. But you can also see that as her blaming a woman for something a man did because she couldn't stand up against the man. Even still, Medusa was still killed and sent on a quest that Athena helped with because Athena is known to help male heroes. She helped Odysseus, she helped Perseus. That is one of her main things. Athena was not a matriarch. There's better goddesses to like, guys. I don't like her. I don't like her, okay? Something's off about her. She doesn't support other women. And I'm not here for that. Support women, love women, care about women, give women a little smooth. In Aeschylus' famous set of plays, the Arrestia, 
Athena is the judge of a trial against Orestes after he killed his mother Clytemnestra. Apollo, acting as Orestes' defense attorney, argues that the wrong committed by Clytemnestra killing Orestes' father Agamemnon is greater than the wrong Orestes committed because the man mounts to create life whereas a woman is a stranger fostering a stranger. AK, you know the baby you had to carry for nine months that screwed up all your hormones? That's a stranger to you. That's a man's property. You're a man's property. So Athena agrees with this logic because she's the girl who goes on an alpha male podcast and says, yes, you're so right. You're so valid. I would never date a beta male. So Athena says, oh yeah, I was born on my dad's head and I didn't need a mother. That's because your dad ate your mother and she was a little fly in his brain. Who would have thunk? You didn't need a mom. Anyways, prosecution, the theories were a group of women described as inhuman, grotesque creatures, fatherless by birth, fun, does give arguments, but they appear to be irrational and beastly compared to Athena and Apollo. This makes Apollo and Orestes' argument seem more sound, especially because Athena agrees with them. The jury of Athens then is tied between whether or not to put Orestes to death. Athena, as the judge, gave her final verdict and ruled in favor of the Orestes, demonstrating in her view that the father is more important than the mother. The trial is decided by random Athenians with Athena as their guide, and although she is a woman, the choice to rule against a woman falls on her shoulders, and it shows she defers to the man. It demonstrates what should be done in Athenian courts courts Athenian women were not allowed to speak in. Therefore, Athena may be a female goddess, but her depiction in one of the most popular plays during Athenian democracy does not suggest anything feminist. I think that it is good for us to reclaim, and I bet women at the time did find her appealing as a strong woman who fought in wars and did all these things, but at the end of the day, men still used her image when they could to depict what an ideal woman should do. In fact, this play also touches on other aspects of the women's life and power through Clytemnestra, Orestes' mother. The trial of Orestes is introduced by the murder of Clytemnestra, the sister of Helen, who, if you don't know, Helen was the woman said to have started the Trojan War, the most beautiful woman in the world. Clytemnestra is married to Agamemnon, the king of Mycenae, and one of the leaders of the Trojan War fight the war, Artemis demanded, as if traded for all the Trojan blood that would be spilled, Agamemnon had to sacrifice his daughter, and he agreed. Clytemnestra did obviously not want her daughter to be killed, so she plotted to kill Agamemnon to get rid of him out of anger and revenge. The first play of the Orestia does a few things in a way of making Clytemnestra's anger and want for revenge make sense. The Trojan War angers some of the Greek citizens for being over another man's wife, Helen. It is also very important to note that Aeschylus wrote this around the 5th century in Democratic Athens, which means that many of the people living there would have been familiar with another founding myth about Athens' first autochthonous king of Athens, Erechthus. To win a war against Eleusis, he had to sacrifice one of his daughters. His daughters asked him to kill all of them so that he would not have to choose. These daughters and Iphigenia are therefore martyrs for male causes, war. Their deaths and their blood spilled was needed for men to fight and to succeed. With that background, the argument could be made that this is what is expected of women, to give up their bodies for the successes of men. And there is an argument here that I'm not smart enough or more qualified to make, that this is how the dominant white, cis, hetero, patriarchal societies see everyone who is not them. Give up your body for them. Give up your labor and your life and your time for their society and their comfort and their luxury. Therefore, Clytemnestra should not be enraged by her daughter's murder. The mythology makes the argument that women should give up their bodies for men's causes. 
I understand war affects everyone, but these women had no decision in it. That is the truth with every aspect of politics in Athens and today, where the representation of America's Congress of women is still 27%. And that is not even talking about other marginalized groups who make up Congress. All of us are expected to do what we need to do to hold up the dominant power and to give up our bodies for the cause. We don't really get to have a say in what our bodies are used for. Men do. Think of the abortion laws passing right now. Your body is not your own in these societies, and that's not fair. And Agamemnon got to decide what happened with Iphigenia's body, as many men in America today get to police the decisions of women's bodies. In the subsequent trial of Orestes, Iphigenia's murder is never mentioned in the play to explain why Clytemnestra's murder of Agamemnon might have been justified. Because the female body is not as important as being but a tool for men to control us. The second play of the Orestia, the Libation Barrows, is vehemently against women in politics. It's already clear through Clytemnestra's tyrannical rule that women must be these evil sexual beings whose value is placed in their use to men and producing offspring, not as individuals with thoughts and feelings. This is why Clytemnestra, after taking power when her husband dies, makes a city terrible under her control. To Athenians, when women are in charge, the world falls to shambles. And yet, Aeschylus' portrayal of women in power is kinder than other contemporary works. Clytemnestra is just as a selfish leader who wants money and control. While this is just one version of Clytemnestra's story, it was also famously performed several times to the Athenian public and reflected their values at the time. However, I would argue that Clytemnestra did nothing wrong. She's cool, she's girl boss, she's girl boss. Um, Clytemnestra did nothing wrong. What, you think killing your husband is bad? Okay, okay, so we're just not gonna live in a society where killing your husband is, I don't know, hot, attractive? We're gonna live in a world where getting revenge for your daughter's murder and taking like, bodily autonomy and deciding to run a city and also marrying some guy for his money isn't inspirational to many young women. I mean, Clyde and Esther's story is a fake story. I mean, like, it doesn't sound like how we treat women in politics now, does it? Does it? Content warning here for mentions of sexual assault. Let's get to this timestamp. An Aristophanes assembly woman, a mythological matriarchy is portrayed rather than a solo female ruler. The woman, tired of not having a say in politics, sneak into the assembly as men and make an argument that women should be put in charge instead. They argue that men always go to war and women will make sure the soldiers are protected and always fed. Ha ha, very sexist, appealing to the motherly attributes associated with women. They win and the play skips forward in time to a younger gentleman calling on a young girl. He has to be secret about it because if an old woman spots him, she'll force him to sleep with her. In fact, he does get caught and a horrifying scene ensues in which a man tries to get out of sleeping with the old woman by reciting different rules surrounding the laws that women put in place. The law states that young men must have sex with an older woman of the house before they call upon a younger woman. Every law that would protect this man or stop the older woman from having sex with him has been overturned and he only manages to escape by distracting her and running out of the house. The idea here is that if women are given power over democracy, they will give into their perverse sexual nature and force men to have sex with them. This is why men have to be in charge. And this is played for laughs and this is what men fear. They fear being attacked or being hurt or their masculinity being put in jeopardy and they come up with this gross scenario that was played for laughs and this is ancient they think that's how the world is and everyone is so scared of losing their power. Athenian women in many plays, specifically Aristophanes, are sex-driven. His depiction of women argues that they are emotional and cannot control their desires. They cannot participate in a government because their need for sex, as well as their neuroticism, prevents them from making rational decisions. They come up with all these biological reasons because they're scared. And this need for sex and neuroticism is an idea that surrounds a lot of marginalized women specifically PLC women. Women are often the subjects of these plays and their gain of power makes their true nature come to light. 
but they can be a good Athenian woman. Meanwhile, medic and enslaved women get the full force of this ideology thrust upon them. And these ideas still are less prevalent with your good little 50s housewife and are a lot more prevalent. Specifically, this idea of being more overtly sexual is something that marginalized women, specifically POC women, have to deal with. So, part three. Class differences. Women are off the subject of these plays and their gain of power makes their true nature come to light, but they can be good Athenian women. Meanwhile, medic and enslaved women get the full force of this ideology thrust upon them. The evilness of medic and enslaved women depicted in Athenian culture comes from the sexual nature, which is suppressed in Athenian women by putting Athenian men in charge of them. In other words, men are scared of female sexuality and desire. Anyone who's scared of me should be. But they are allowed to lust after women and objectify their bodies. But female desire is seen as a threat. In Aeschylus' portrayal of Clytemnestra, she desires power and revenge. She is too emotional and her decision to kill her husband is irrational. However, Euripides' portrayal of Medea could suggest the same. Jason leaves Medea, a powerful witch, for the king of Corinth's daughter. This left Medea, an outsider in a foreign country, and her children illegitimate. Jason's decision could be seen as rational. It helps his status and gives him the wealth. Medea then kills their children to get back at him, something seen as irrational. However, I would say it's Jason's fault, but this is not my sophomore year AP Lit class, and I don't have to debate this with you. This tradition continues in the Roman Republic and Empire, with the Aeneid having Queen Dido get rid of herself after Aeneas leaves her, believing the two had been married when to Aeneas they just had sex. A big difference here though is that Dido and Medea are explicitly foreign women. They are also portrayed, in my opinion, as more sexual and seductresses. Clytemnestra cheats, but she is still very much a manly figure. The famous mythological texts seem to mostly argue that women who give power cannot wield it properly because they are too emotional. These materials, as well as the way women are objectified in art, makes them seem like they are a different species. As Hesiod suggests, women are necessary for men because they can make children. And again, this is an AFAB definition of women. Society is more complex than whatever Hesiod's tiny little child mind can wrap its head around. By creating a plethora of, of art, plays, and rhetoric centering women being villains of power and or sexual beings, it suggests that men are afraid of female power because it contradicts their rational order of things. It allows them to believe that women must be subjugated and kept in the home. And well, yes, I would never like to touch grass again, that's my decision. That's not a man's decision. In fact, they should be encouraging me to go outside so I can't make any more YouTube videos. An Athenian woman would bear children, tend to the home, and please her husband, subduing her deviant nature. Ancient Athenian texts, including Aristophanes' plays, most notably the assembly women, suggest women's unregular nature is to be sexual. Medic women, especially those without families, were likely to be called whores for not confirming to their specific gender roles. These roles of staying in the household and finding a good husband would often be harder for medic women to fulfill because of financial and citizenship restraints. The same can be said for American culture. Women of color, specifically black women, are seen as overtly sexual. They are brutalized more and are seen as more mature and sexually knowledgeable when they are children. When discussing the rights of women in a democratic society, it is important to understand that the view society imposes on their sexuality and how it differs based on class, race, and other dividing factors. Medic women, enslaved women, and other women considered an outsider may have been freer with their bodies and their sexualities, but that came and still comes with more brutalization of their bodies. Their bodies were also more likely to be exposed in Greek art. Amazons were sometimes depicted bare-chested, like they were on the west frieze of the Parthenon and on certain funeral sarcophagi. The Greeks believed that the Amazons cauterized one of their breasts so they could fire a bow and arrow with ease, which is kind of badass, but also it's another example of women are destroying their bodies. Shut up. Women are not destroying their bodies. Let people do whatever they want to do with their bodies. This exposure demonstrates that the Amazons had a lack of humility and they had a perverse sexual nature. 
foreign women were seen as sexually transmitted diseases to these people. They were seen to infect men and draw them away from their households. Pericles' law, therefore, as we talked about earlier, required the Athenian citizens had two Athenian parents, meaning a man could not marry a foreign woman. Again, this was to create a dominant Athenian race. Race is a social construct, so it's changed over the last 2,000 years. So, to Athenian citizens, uh, any non-Athenian woman became the sexual deviants that could seduce men out of marriages to an Athenian woman. A marvelous sarcophagi made in Thessaloniki in the 4th century depicts the contrast well. The woman honored at the top is stately, well-dressed. In other models of the sarcophagus, the woman is depicted with fabric that clings to her body, but her husband is next to her, and her face is neutral. She is a stately woman. She's a good lady. Below her is a barbaric Amazonian woman, who each have one breast displayed. The mythological battle and defeat of the Amazons was actually a metaphor for the Persian War. The, the Persians, foreigners, were represented by wild women. The Amazons did not follow the cultural ideas of women and therefore scenes of their brutalization, the defeat of a female society, is celebrated and contrasted on a woman's gravestone. The contrast continues in this red figure Kylix created by Macron, women, most likely prostitutes, adorn the outside of the cup. The women, while not in a state of undress, do have part of their hair uncovered in public, which was improper. They also are with men in a public setting, a party, and are there to entertain them. In democratic Athens, it was seen as improper for Athenian women to party with men. The kylix would be used to drink wine during these parties. The inside of the cup depicted a wife, hair covered, regal, and making a libation for a religious practice to remind the husband of his duties to her, even as he is being entertained by other women. Women who were thought to be lesser by virtue of their birth, like medic women and enslaved women, were seen as more sexual. It would even appear on objects meant for women to use. In a red figure Hydria of Cassandra and Trojan woman, Cassandra is depicted fully nude with only a piece of cloth around her shoulders. Athena stands behind her, but does not seem to protect her from the Greek soldier that is attacking her. It may be that the soldier is supposed to be a villain of the scene, but Athenian art usually had a broader social context. Therefore, it may be that Cassandra represents a medic woman. Cassandra and the other Trojan women on this vase came to Athena's temple to receive sanctuary, and yet the Greeks still take them. Athena, who is standing over them, does not stop the situation. The treatment of medic women is therefore just in the eyes of the gods. In the eyes of Athena, who again, I just don't like her. I just... Look, I know we should be supporting other women, but do I really need to support a 2,000 year old goddess? The answer is no. In the myth history of Greece, the Trojan War was fought between the Greek city-states and Troy. After the war, Agamemnon, the king of Mycenae, takes Cassandra as his concubine. Cassandra was the daughter of Priam, the king of Troy and priestess of Apollo, the god of prophecy. Apollo fell in love with Cassandra, but she denied his advances. So he cursed her, and he was like, okay, no one will ever believe your prophecies, ha ha ha. And while Cassandra herself could be explored in detail in like its own video in regards of a history of people not believing women, it's more important for this essay that you understand Cassandra as a foreign woman about to be enslaved. A hydria would have been carried by women, mostly enslaved women, to procure water. The Hydria, therefore, may be a cruel reminder of their place in the world by depicting a woman taken from her homeland by Greek soldiers to work for Athens. By objectifying Cassandra and putting her full body on display, this art piece also serves as a reminder of the objectification of women. All women, regardless of class, were bombarded by images of their bodies as art pieces for men to enjoy. This hydria was for personal use, but it still dehumanizes women and serves to displace them as people who could function autonomously in Athenian democracy. Because the art was put on an object women would use to do their jobs. Art, both public and private, both visual and written, were obsessed with the female body. And the same is true today. Part four, time is a fucking circle. 
Time does not exist. It was a concept made up for us to conceptualize our days, to understand how some dumb rocks circle around the sun, to find a way to worship the moon and know when Mercury would screw us over. Time is a construct used to decide how much to sleep and eat, to breathe and work. Time is a little boy's mom I met in the line at a 7-Eleven buying a six pack and told me she was from the beginning and the end of time and then offered to pay for my gasoline in exchange for the number of the weed dealer at my high school. Well, time is a game game I invented to sell more monster high dolls at a rapidly raising price. Time is the forgery of a Van Gogh work you found in your neighbor's garage sale for $4.99. Time is a cheap plastic tube stuffed inside a long Furby. Time is a construct. And women who choose to show their bodies and be more sexual are bombarded with negative attention from the media. Recent controversy with singer Billie Eilish, who we will not be talking about her or herself or her music in any personal details because this is not what we do here. We're just gonna talk about her image and what happened. So she posed in lingerie for Vogue, which caused an uproar throughout social media, with many people angered with her presenting herself in a sexual manner. But this attention is exactly what leads women to being famous. Most pop singers and actresses will be asked about their diets and their makeup routines and how they maintain their beauty and their bodies and their sizes even when they're pregnant and they are asked to advertise products like perfume and shampoo and makeup and diet supplements and then they are criticized when they do it. And maybe some of it is wrong and maybe some of it is bad because we are portraying unrealistic beauty standards to women, but we are also projecting those unrealistic standards onto women who are trying to get a leg up in the world and to keep their jobs, they're gonna keep doing things to maintain their position or whatever. And it goes deeper than these famous figures. Women's body and the way women act has always been a part of media and American democratic society. Most of the tropes known today in movies build off of tropes of the past. These tropes were monitored by Say it with me, everyone. The Hayes Code, my beloved. A set of rules the government enforced on film studios that did not allow any sexually deviant woman to have a happy ending and that every good woman must end up with a man at the end of the movie in order to be a part of some otherwise Christian female position. The idea led to femme fatale tropes where beautiful women would use men for personal gain, which is girl bossing. They would flaunt their sexualities, girl bossing, and then be killed or met by some other unhappy fate at the end of the movie if they did not submit to the man, which is just not girl boss not even girl red. So these tropes still live on today in the form of a mean girl, a feminine woman who uses her sexuality to gain power for her own evil goals, often by using men. Watch my mean girls and sexuality video because the mean girl is mostly used for female audiences that flaunt femininity and to show female audiences that flaunting femininity and sexuality is bad. And while there is a case that a lot of women do have to be more sexual to get ahead and that maybe it in fact isn't exactly liberation, we still shouldn't judge women for how they present themselves in any way. And it shouldn't be bad to be sexy and cool. And it also shouldn't be bad to be, you know, more clothed and modest. Just let women be. This idea retextures the dichotomy between the good housewife and the sexual foreigner from ancient Greece to reaffirm the same point. So what does this all mean for democracy? It means that women were othered and have to continue to be othered from men and made to seem either emotional as objects or some other lesser being that leaves them heavily scrutinized so that their participation in democratic society is perceived as wrong or immoral because they are wicked. The ideas from millennia ago still pervade today, making it harder for women to get ahead in American government positions. Their actions are scrutinized more than men's. There is an expectation placed on women to be motherly and kind or emotional and hypersexual. The first means that they are too soft to work in government and their duties to their home are important. The second means that they would ruin democracy if they were allowed to participate. From the beginnings of democracy to American democracy, rhetoric and media have found a way to keep the public perception of women negative. And while their lives were probably more or less unimpeded by men harassing them, it is likely images of their bodies in public statues and myths 
constantly reminded women of their place and value like social media does for young women today. In order for democracy to represent the will of its citizens, all the citizens must move past the exclusionary rhetoric it has for women and see women, and I mean all women, as fully realized human beings. Anyway, I'm Hillary Clinton, and thank you for watching episode 37 of White Women's Feminism. My strawberry crystal light is out, which means it's time for me to go back into my cryogenic chamber. I mean, doing human things like eating and watching a good old game of sports ball. That's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I am sorry. I know this will be long because I have like an hour of footage. Who is she? This was a thing I was gonna do for a video essay back in December and then my professor was like uh don't do that and I was like why and I think she realized that it was gonna be more work than I thought it was gonna be because I don't want to edit this thing but I'm going to what's in the future I don't know but you should like and subscribe and do all the boobalaboo so that you can find out yes and please leave a comment and talk to me. And remember, this is not all my thoughts on ladies, but it is some of them.